Hello, and welcome to another episode of Wrestling Doesn't Make Sense. We're going to talk about how a little sense wrestling makes. Um, we were just a few days removed at the time of recording from the Royal Rumble 2019. And uh, before the Rumble, I had heard rumors of how the WWE were going to kickstart the uh, tag team division again amid rumors of the the revival who had reportedly requested their release because one they weren't happy with how they were being booked but also they weren't happy with how the tag team division as a whole was being booked and from what i had heard the wwe were gonna make amends by making the revival a key part of the tag team scene and changing the tag team scenes up so that it was exciting again and you know it would be a good thing to be in a tag team as opposed to just a, a side like an afterthought like it seems like a lot of tag teams are in the main mm-hmm. roster so then the royal rumble happens and on the pre-show the raw tag team titles not on the line at all on this show Nope. Which, on one hand, is a good thing, because the show was already so fucking long. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, let's not crowbar in stuff that doesn't need to be in. But um, on the pre-show, like, unannounced, there was a tag team match right at the beginning, which was the Mm -hmm. Raw Tag Team Champions, Chad Gable and Bobby Roode, against one member of the Revival and one member of the Authors of Pain. Yep. Scott and, Dawson and Reza. Yeah, because Akam is injured or whatever. Yeah. And so they said, what we're going to do is, if this <coughs> team, comprised of half of the Revival and half of the Authors of Pain, can beat the Tag Team Champions, both teams will be heavily considered to be the next contenders for the belts, essentially. Yeah. Which makes sense. Those are two big teams that did very well in NXT that have kind of lost momentum, and they need to get that momentum back. Mm Mm-hmm. So, obviously they lost. (laughs) (laughs) So now they both teams continue to look like dorks because they can't beat these two... These two throw together guys, yeah, who aren't a proper tag team, yeah. So they're, they're like a thrown together team, but I don't think that that's not necessarily a detriment to their ability to work as a team. Mm. Um, but at the same time, they have been thrown together, and the the two t- other teams in this equation are both established tag teams. Yeah, they work well, you know, with their respective tag partner. And it just seems like a like it, that that whole thing seems totally contrary to any rumors that that spiraled around before the Royal Rumble. In that they're not going to revitalize the tag team scene, and they're not going to push the revival because look at what happened in this totally unannounced stupid match on the pre-show. It's a total afterthought, and who knows what's going to happen with the tag titles now. So then, on the SmackDown side of things, we have The Bar, who are a really good tag team. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sheamus and Cesaro. Very, very good tag team. Again, they got thrown together, but they gelled really well and made the most of their situation. So they've done really well as a tag team. Absolutely. One of the best tag teams on SmackDown. And SmackDown have some pretty damn good tag teams as well, so I was saying something. Yes, indeed. So obviously they lost the tag titles to The Miz and a non-wrestler. Well, let's be fair here. All right. um, (laughs) Well, for one thing, Shane McMahon obviously has got a bit of wrestling experience. Not the best. Uh, you have to say, but um, you know he's he's taken a fair few bumps over the years. Where you think, okay, fair enough, you can get away with uh, uh, you know still wrestling at this day and age. But uh, I think, like importantly, 
yeah, they're not a great team in a traditional sense, but it seems like at least there's some sort of story behind this where it's going to end up with, I mean, you'd you'd assume it's going to be Miz turning on Shane at some point, setting up a WrestleMania match. And in that case, I don't really mind the SmackDown tag team titles being used as a prop in that story. Well, I do, because... The um, because it means the end result is going to be the Miz versus Shane McMahon at WrestleMania, <laughs> which I'm going to tell you, this is going to be no surprise to you. I don't want to see that match. Yeah, boy, I, I boy, I really don't want to see that match. Um, but what if what if they get Miz's dad involved as well? Surely that would <laughs> bolt up the interest. <laughs> oh, oh wow. I saw somebody propose that they do The Miz and The Miz's Dad versus Vince and Shane McMahon. (laughs) Which was cute, but also I don't want to see that. Um, uh, I also don't think it's a good idea because I don't see why the tag titles have to be involved. Like, isn't that the perfect catalyst for them turning on each other the fact yeah, that they can't work together as a team why do they have to be tag champions and then there's a turn do they have to lose the belts and then there's a turn because he's like yeah. you, you cost me the title so I'm like well you only won them like a fucking <laughs> fucking two weeks ago or whatever like how long is their tag title reign gonna last I mean yeah that's a good question uh, but I think and them winning the titles and the way they've sold it this week, especially with like the all you know, the hugging and bringing in Miz's dad, and um, I think the the way they're trying to play it is actually quite smart because it's uh, Shane has never really had that kind of approval from his dad, uh, Vince obviously, so he's kind of almost basking in the fact that uh, Miz's dad is all proud of. Uh, you know, Miz, and he's kind of living almost vicariously through Miz. Which is fucking ridiculous because Shane McMahon is, what, a 50-year-old man? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Who has definitely moved on with his life. And and if he hasn't, his dad is still Vince McMahon. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And also, one thing that really fucking bugged me was... On the Royal Rumble, when you listen to the commentary, how badly they were plugging the fact that it's been Shane McMahon's dream to win the tag titles. Yeah, yeah. What the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) What? What What is any of that? If it was his dream, why didn't he do it fucking years ago? 20 years ago, yeah. Right. You know, plenty of opportunity for him. Why does... Why does winning a tag title seem to elevate him in front of his father or, like, impress somebody else's father? Like, and also, they're a team. They, mm. they both won the tag titles. You know, the Miz's father can't go, well done, Shane, you did a really good job. Not the Miz, though, <laughs> fuck you. You know, my fucking flesh and blood. You didn't do anything that match that you both won. Like, what? A, it's it's a weird. I don't know. I don't buy it. Mm. You know. It's, you know, I'm not saying it's like a perfect storyline <laughs> or anything. Yeah, <laughs> not by a long shot. But my overall point was that once again, Sheamus and Cesaro have lost the belts, the tag belts, to somebody who is not a a wrestler. I mean, you can can paint it whatever way you want, but Shane McMahon isn't on the road fucking 24-7 wrestling with those other guys. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's... it's, You wouldn't call Vince McMahon a wrestler. He has wrestled, but he is not a wrestler. Definitely not. (laughs) And the same is for Shane. Yes, he's got his spots, but that doesn't mean he's a fucking, you know, a, a wrestler. So... That doesn't do anything for the tag division either. On the other side, it, 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 you know, like coming out of the Royal Rumble, the tag team division did look did not look any better. Um, 
if anything, it looked worse. Well, I see. I still disagree with this because I think uh, SmackDown this week you had that big kind of uh, four-way elimination tag team match to determine the new number one contenders. Uh, that was definitely, uh, you know, a big chunk of SmackDown and kind of a good highlight of the tag team division. So I don't think it's, you know, taken any more focus off the tag team division at all. I think in a way, maybe it's, it's you know, they're, they're doing this storyline with Shane and Miz, but they've definitely not abandon the rest of the teams in the division. Just most of them. Yeah. Like, well, he's... I mean, they've always had that issue anyway, though. Right. Where but I'm like, you they're, can... they're not doing a very good job of revitalizing the, you know, having, like, for example, if they have all, they, they had a four, what, four team elimination match or whatever, right? Yeah. But if all four of those teams aren't going to be on SmackDown next week, you know, what's the point? That's that's like, that's like a one-off match. It's like a like a plaster over a head wound. You know what I mean? Like there's uh, sanity aren't doing anything, and mm. uh, Primo and Ep- Epico aren't doing anything. Why not instead of just going look at the tag teams we have in one match? Why not? Because I think they're starting to do that with um, Gallows and Anderson. Yeah. Um, who are they fighting? Somebody I don't fucking remember. Uh, it's, uh, well, that's another kind of random tag team they seem to be putting together is uh, Shinsuke, Nakamura, and Rusev. Oh, don't even get me started on that shit. We're going to have to get onto that in a second. <laughs> but again, like, that's that that's good because now you're, you're, you're involving a tag team like Gallows and Anderson. And, yeah. like, while they may not be gunning for the belts, they're on TV, and it seems like they're going to be doing a storyline with somebody, which is good. That's That's what you want. You want to, you know, start filling the cracks that way, and you want to, you want to put guys like Sanity on TV more, and just have them around and have them be a presence, even if mm. they didn't do anything. Have them on TV and let the other tag teams know that they're there. You know yeah. what I mean? Because that'll that'll take up fucking no time at all. You have like a, a five minute promo by Eric Young, and the others all standing around him going there, you know, in some warehouse or something. And put that on TV, and then everybody goes, can't, you know, gotta watch out for those guys. Because they can't do that right now, because you haven't seen them at all. It's mm. silly. Um, so people forget they exist. You gotta, you gotta build a tag team scene up by actually featuring the fucking people on it, on a, on a regular basis. Um, but I would say it's, uh, it's like the women's division, in a way. It's a tough thing to kind of... Uh, you know, dish out, like, equal time for everyone on both Raw and SmackDown. Well, I mean, SmackDown especially, because uh, there's only, you know, a two-hour show. they got to highlight all the uh, the main guys, the, like, main single uh, singles guys, all the, like, title feuds and whatnot. Uh, and then once you get all that out of the way, there's not a lot of room left for, you know, building up other tag teams or... Uh, other women feuds or whatever like uh, uh, Raw you could say I mean that's a three hour show with so much filler in it that they probably could start doing that but you know Smackdown kind of gets a pass from me well here's the thing man when Smackdown went live they used to they, they pierced it perfectly because they would pierce it the way NXT do it where they put a lot of focus on um, like a lot of focus on a specific division at one point, but mm. they would hype the fact that the next week you were going to see matches involved in the other division. Yeah. And so you'd still see key members of a division on the show, but if they weren't being featured heavily, you knew that the slack was going to get picked up the next week. And I don't really know if that's still the case these days. Um, I don't know if it's... There was a point where I stopped watching SmackDown because it wasn't as good as it had been when it went live. Mm. And I was uh, disappointed about that because it was really good when it went live because they paced it right and they gave everybody... And also because the the, the divisions when they started were, were kind of like the women's and the tag team were kind of small, but they, yeah. they, had, they had just the right amount of numbers to keep everybody busy. 
Yeah, yeah, and they like just introduced their own like individual titles as well. So they were able to do like a tag team tournament to crown the first tag team champions. Uh, and I seem to remember there was like lots of women involved in the the crowning of the first SmackDown Women's Title uh, Champion as well. So uh, I guess in those situations they kind of benefited it from it being almost like a, a brand new start, a brand new show. Well, yeah, but, but like, after all that stuff got introduced, like, the, you know, the, all the teams involved would be feuding with each other, you know, but mm. like, say there's six teams, that's, you know, you could pair them off in three different scenarios. And then after a month or two of that, you switch it around, so one of the other teams is fighting somebody else and... But, you know, they're all still involved and they're all busy against each other. Yeah. And it was the same with the women. You could have one um, girl going after the champion and then one girl going to be the number one contender. So she's fighting against another girl. And then below that, just, you know, two girls who want to fight because they have some kind of beef with each other. Um, and, it, like you know, it all worked out. It was all timed well. Mm. And now there's so many people on, on, um, on both rosters and in both divisions where it's very hard it seems kind of like they don't know who to give time to so yeah so they don't do a very good job of it whenever what they should be doing more is just managing the time better so that they can give more time to the people that aren't getting enough time <laughs> if you know what you mean um they just need to kind of sort it out better and like it there's no reason why they can't start doing more of this on their stupid other shows like main event and superstars if they still make them i don't even know if they still make them but i'm like if they if they do still make them like the, that's an extra hour or two of television that could easily have storylines developed on it or carried over yeah but it's an extra hour of television that people don't watch so it's almost a wasted effort i'd say but then, don't. But then, why do it at all? That's a good question. You know, I like, have no idea why the <laughs> main event exists anymore. It's it's fun, but like if you're gonna do it, give it some purpose. You can, mm. you can get away with stuff. So I'm like, if you're gonna have TV time, you may as well use it properly. But um, yeah, I don't know. At the moment, I'm not convinced with the tag team scene and their I mean, if this is your attempt to revive it then um, you're in trouble, you know? <laughs> That's what yeah. I mean. But um, I think it might come back to a case of, like, just the rosters being too bloated, though. Like, you kind of said that before, but it is, I mean, especially on SmackDown's, uh, like, the SmackDown side of things, I think they would benefit from not having so many teams involved, whereas Raw would benefit of having more um, and then, like, when it comes uh, to the next draft or whatever, um, you know, you can uh, swap in different teams into the SmackDown side of things, so that creates fresh matches again. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It seems like they've tried giving SmackDown too many tag teams that they can't really afford the TV time to, whereas on Raw, they've got, like, a bunch of, like, thrown together tag teams really like Heath Slater and Rhino and Curtis Axel and Bo Dallas uh, Bobby Roode and Chad Gable like all these teams which aren't real teams um, but uh, and don't really get featured at all anyway so it's it's a weird situation yeah I mean I think you're, you're right in that it wouldn't hurt for like a team from Smackdown to go to Raw just you know for no reason it's probably a better option and uh, because they might get better tv time but then again like you said as well their their handling of, of the division hasn't gotten any, gotten any better no so you know making the jump from smackdown to raw probably wouldn't make a heck of a lot of difference um yeah probably not not until well it all depends on how deep they want to go into reviving the tag team division because like it is still early days yet and 
you can see that they're trying to give things a bit more focus, but they're still kind of, I don't know, hesitant almost, it seems like, where they don't want to give it too much and their, their focus is like elsewhere, uh, which is understandable with like, you know, entering WrestleMania season and whatnot. So it's it's one of those situations where I can see like lots of multi-team tag team matches, which wouldn't be a bad thing because it just gets everyone out there and gives the audience a chance to kind of connect with them as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not opposed to that as well. Like, uh, yeah, exactly. Like, so long as people are on TV, then they're okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you don't want to be forgotten about. If you're on TV, then, you know, shit's going to be all right eventually. Because uh, mm. you can get yourself over if you're on TV. You can't do anything if you're not there, you know? Yeah. Um, I don't know. What did you think of the Royal Rumble in general? Uh, I thought it was uh, a, an all right show. Like, I really enjoyed the... The two women's title matches, I thought those were both really good. Um, I wasn't a massive fan of most of the women's Royal Rumble because I thought, well, for one thing, like the, the I'd say the first half of the match seemed a bit off. Like uh, I don't know, it's hard to describe, but like it seemed like there was a few like moments of miscommunication and. Uh, spots that didn't quite come off as they were supposed to. Uh, and then the match itself just kind of went on and on. And I think it was like 72 minutes long in total and like felt 72 minutes mm. long. Mm. Um, but like the, the closing, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes were awesome. Uh, that's when it really kicked into high gear. But, uh, the, the, you know, the match that kind of disappointed me the most, which I would never have said, going into it was Daniel Bryan and AJ Styles. Yeah. It was a weird, weird match where like the crowd just seemed completely burnt out from the Royal Rumble, uh, the women's Rumble going so long. Uh, and then they like wrestled this really kind of technical match, which, you know, uh, people kind of weren't, not like, necessarily weren't expecting, but it, it kind of, didn't really go so well with the the like um, you know intensity of the rivalry they built up, yeah. and then it had such a shit finish as well with like <laughs> Rowan of all people coming out and just choke slamming AJ Styles. You thought that was a, a shit finish? Yeah, it was. It's just like um, WWE booking one hundred and one. Really, it's so lazy and uninspired. Well, um, let me let me counter with this. Would you rather have seen that finish, or would you rather have seen AJ Styles getting kicked in the balls again? Well, yeah, that's. It. I mean, you could say in that respect, maybe it's an improvement, but yeah, I don't know. It just didn't really work for me. Uh, it's a bit disappointing. I'd like to go back and watch that match at a later point because I think. Uh, what you said was correct and that people were kind of fatigued by that point because I know I was. Mm. Um, so I'd like to watch it again with like a fresher pair of eyes because by that point I was just kind of like, I don't know how much attention I'm paying to the show. I thought the, um, I actually thought the women's Royal Rumble match was better than the men's Royal Rumble match. Mm. For a couple of reasons. One, I just I didn't think there was a whole lot to the men's Royal Rumble match. Everything just went and it worked and it was fine. But the women's match had some fun spots in it. It had um let me tell you what I've 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 grown to love over the past couple of months is Alicia Fox and her hats. Really? I fucking I love this. This is a this is a weird conversation, but um, a few months ago, me and my brother, when we watch pay per views, we'll like chat over WhatsApp or whatever, and we were talking about how wrestlers don't wear hats anymore, because you know Shawn Michaels used to wear a hat, and even Stone Cold would wear a hat, you know, and the King and Jr. both had hats, and we were just like Randy Savage, we were just like listing off people 
who had hats for no reason. Uh, some match was on with um, Alicia Fox and she was wearing this great costume, great outfit and had like a matching hat on it and uh, we were like, now that's how you do it, you know, that's a real, it's a great hat. And so <laughs> since then, I just kept an eye on her outfits and her hats and stuff, you know, and then right. she, she always delivers. Alicia Fox, great outfit, great hat all the time. Now, I, I think it was Survivor Series I can't remember, but whatever pay-per-view had the finals of that mixed match challenge, you know? Yeah. Alicia Fox was in that. And her and, I think, Jinder versus R-Truth and Carmella. Yeah. And just at some point, Alicia and Carmella are in the ring. And Alicia just goes, give me my hat! And the fucking referee or timekeeper has to give her her hat and she starts wearing it in the ring. It's such a weird spot, but it made me laugh so much because we've been talking about hats. And now she's putting all this focus on the hat. We just thought this was hilarious. Mm. So at the Royal Rumble, Alicia Fox comes out. She's got a great outfit on. She has a hat. She gets into the ring, puts her hat down. and um, And then... Shortly after that, we get a hat spot where she puts a hat on Maria and Maria walks around and then she stomps on the hat. And then, you know, Alicia freaks out. And I'm like, now nah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Quality spot. It was a funny little moment um, that gave a little bit of TV time to people who need TV time. You know what I mean? Yeah, I guess. It's like a character-building moment. Exactly. Uh, it's just a silly little thing, but it was cute, and it's perfect for both of those characters. It was a nice thing. You know what I mean? There were, yeah. little, there were little bits like that that I really liked about the Women's Royal Rumble. The Men's Royal Rumble had Jeff Jarrett in it. <laughs> now, if you know one thing about me, it's that I have a severe distaste for The Miz and for Jeff Jarrett. And, and this show had both of them on it. <laughs> so, which I believe is the only show in history that has had both of the the Miz and Jeff Jarrett on it at the same time. So, uh, automatically, I, <laughs> I'm not having a good time with this show. Um, I, I like the spot with uh, Titus O'Neil when he came to the Rumble. Uh, which spot was that? He came out to the Rumble and he was running down the ramp and then right before he got to the ring, he, he put the brakes on. Oh, yeah, that was pretty funny. I was like, I like that. That was good. Um, and Kurt Hawkins was under the ring, so we chased him under the ring for some reason. Like, that was funny. Yeah. But um, other than that, there wasn't a whole lot of... I didn't think the the, the men's rumble was that, that special, that fantastic. Mm-hmm. And I think both of them had a, a lack of um, surprise entrance, which I thought was interesting well they didn't go with legends so much this year well, yeah. it was all nxt and that dudes. that works really well for the women's rumble because it shows the the depth of the roster and how much talent they have to draw from because last year when they put it on the first time it was all you know legends heavy which was on purpose to get people to watch it yeah. And this year, they focus more on the talent they do have, which is a really, really good idea. But it also meant that the men's rumble was also lacking in any kind of surprise like that, apart from Jeff Jarrett, which is a bad surprise. And I love that part of the rumble. That's one of my favorite bits when you get to see the surprise entrance, you know? And and mm. uh, I didn't get any of that from from either Rumble this year. And like I said, it, it's okay for the women's Rumble, but it was disappointing to see it in the men's Rumble. But I think the guys that they did feature in the, the men's Rumble, like Johnny Gargano, Pete Dunne, and Alistair Black, are all guys who, uh, like, people are excited to see, like, eventually get drafted to the main roster. Because these are all guys who've pretty much carried NXT in NXT UK like in the last couple of years yeah but you know I don't know I didn't think they were any good I didn't think that sorry I was burping there I didn't think that the, the men's rumble was that it just wasn't that interesting I didn't think 
one yeah. one thing I I noticed was that Mustafa Ali um, eliminated Shinsuke Nakamura, who at the time was the United States champion, having just beaten Rusev for the belt mm-hmm. earlier that night. So I thought, all right, I know where that's going. Shinsuke versus Mustafa Ali. I'm not going to say no to that. That sounds great. Let's do that. That's perfect. Um, then later on, I think Mustafa eliminates Samoa Joe. That's right, yeah. And then I was like, oh, imagine that triple threat. Hello. I, I, oh, I'd watch that. That sounds like a great idea. I can't wait to hear what happens on SmackDown this week to see if they can elaborate further on this storyline. And, oh boy, did they deliver. They didn't even think about that scenario, which I maintain is a good scenario. Mm -hmm. Instead, they... Oh, I don't even know. (coughs) Instead, they had Shinsuke defend his belt that he had just won uh, against R-Truth, who bizarrely wasn't allowed into the men's rumble because Nia Jax beat him up. Yeah. So he gets a shot at the US championship and then he wins. Which? Was it a botch or? Well, now here, I'm going to tell you why I don't think it was a botch. Because of what happened immediately after that. It did, I don't know, because it almost seemed like they were like scrambling for an idea of what to do. But then after that with Nakamura and Rusev both attacking uh, our truth, and then kind of having that backstage segment with Anderson and Gallows later on, that made me think, oh, okay, maybe they did plan it. Yeah. But, geez, it looked like a botch when it happened. But here's the thing, man. Why would they send, if it was a botch, why would they send Rusev out there to fix things and for him to lose as well? Mm. Like, that, that, like, if it was a botch, you'd be like, we got to fix this now. We'll have our truth beat somebody else. Like, what? That's, you know, <laughs> that's not a way to fix it. Like, obviously, they have that planned. Otherwise, they're really bad at coming up with stuff on the fly. Yeah. And like you said, there was that kind of, like, hint of the tag team thing between um, Rusev and Nakamura. So it seems like something's afoot, but it's just such a weird way to go about it. Mm. Why? Why? Would Rusev beat Nakamura randomly a couple of weeks ago, only to have him drop the belt back to Nakamura, only to have Nakamura drop it to our truth Like, that, it just seems really strange to me. That's, yeah, that's I mean, so especially weird. with it being our truth as well, like a guy who... Is you know he's pretty entertaining and all, but he's like what like forty six, forty seven, like probably older than that, and not someone who's like I wouldn't say he's massively over. I'd say he's pretty over, but yeah, he's he's not the guy you really want to like build the U.S. title scene around. Right, like he is over and he's really good and like he um. He's and you know if he's a forty something year old guy, he a heck of a sh- he's in heck of a shape. Yeah, that guy looks great, man, and he can still work. And like you know, I don't I don't see them building a division around him, but like you could totally have him in the division as like a linchpin. Mm. It totally could make sense, but like doing it this way, <laughs> does, to be honest with you, doing it that way makes both. Nakamura and Rusev look like idiots. Yeah, because they big spent time. they spent the last month or two fighting each other. You know, you know, belt switches back and forth. They couldn't, so really, neither is of them is any better than the other one. Yeah, and then they both get taken out by our truth, who you know, God bless him, has long been considered on the the south end of the win loss record. Yeah. For him to suddenly come out and like um, beat both of them in one night, essentially, is um, it's strange. You know, it's I don't know. It's 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 a real 
it's a real curveball. Mm. And I, I wouldn't mind it so much. But, like, I like all three of the guys involved, and I don't see what the benefit to the curveball is, other than to throw a curveball. Yeah, you yeah. Know what I mean, it's like whenever, whenever Zack Ryder won the Intercontinental Championship at WrestleMania, and then lost Just it. Just to lose it the next day. Yeah, to The Miz. I'm like, you, you kind of got heat on The Miz, but, like, you know, I don't think it it did a whole lot for anybody there. Like, what? No. It, it, like, it felt more like a swerve, you know, just because everybody was going to say Zack Ryder is the one guy in that match who isn't going to win. <laughs> yeah. And then they go, ah, we swerved you. He actually did win. Anybody can win in a ladder match. And then just fix the mistake the next day. Go, ah, it's, you know, <laughs> ah, fuck you. <laughs> we yeah, got it's you. very we got, we Vince Russo-esque. Yeah, like, it's it, it doesn't really serve a purpose. It's just um, fucking with the fans. Yeah, which I don't think is a good idea. And um, honestly, like, that's one of the things that I kind of... Um, I kind of fear about Triple H taking over the company. Mm. Because, like, Triple H is a smart guy, but he's also a very snarky guy who, in the past, has shown no problem with wasting airtime just to you know, make his own jokes. Yeah. You know, for the expense of, like, whoever. Um, which isn't... That's not just a Triple H thing, by the way. That's a whole click thing. I've been watching some old, like, NWO stuff, and, like, the amount of shit that Scott Hall and Kevin Nash used to get up to on the mic is... on Boy, they just didn't give a shit. <laughs> they were very happy to go out and be snarky and make references to that only they got or like, you know, be very specific in what they said. Yeah. And you're like, this doesn't help anybody. Um, and if anything, it makes you guys look a little bit dickish. Like dicks. Yeah. So maybe that's just a click thing. But well, that's the same sort of thing that Randy Orton did at the uh, end of SmackDown this week, where like everyone was coming out and saying their piece, and Mustafa Ali was coming out and tried saying his piece, and then Randy Orton sort of cut him off before he could finish and said, "Oh, didn't you get eliminated by a woman or something?" And then like uh, Mustafa Ali didn't really get a chance to respond. Yeah, that's not so good. <laughs> I have more questions coming out of the Rumble and coming out of this week than I did like going in which was weird because the Royal Rumble itself is very predictable yeah aside well, from the both of them were the whole show aside from the Nakamura thing which I was really excited about because I love Nakamura and I was mm. so happy he won and then you know understandably less happy whenever he lost <laughs> four days later or two days later or whatever um, but at all the other matches everybody predicted yeah, and yeah. Also everybody predicted the, the Becky thing as well in the Royal Rumble and again not that that's a bad thing because like people have said it was a it was a predictable Rumble but also in, at least in the Royal Rumble matches the right people won the right people went over um, and I guess overall in the whole show the main part of the show, at least, the right people won. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not a big fan of Brock Lesnar being champion anymore, but, like, if 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 your heart is set on Lesnar versus Rollins, then fine, you know, go with it. But, I mean, you know, we could have been getting Balor versus Rollins. Who's going to say no to that? Hell yeah. I don't know. Ugh, but... You know, Ugh, I I thought the rumble overall was just okay. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I didn't think it was anything exciting. Not you know, I really liked the women's the the SmackDown women's match. Mm -hmm. I think I like I think that was match of the night for me. And um, it's rough when the match of the night is the first one. And you, st you still have four hours to go. Oh, Jesus, I think, yeah. I think that's a rough... That's not a good way to book a show. 
we should probably talk about Dean Ambrose at some point. Yeah, I guess so. Because that's the big news that's come out of the Royal Rumble, really. Yeah. The, the biggest news. Because, like you say, everything else is pretty predictable. But I don't think anyone really saw Dean Ambrose not re-signing with WWE once his contract expires. No. I am um, very, very disappointed about this. Because... Dean Ambrose is one of my favorites. I um, I started getting back into watching wrestling whenever CM Punk came along, and then once he was there, I I kept watching because we got Daniel Bryan, who you just knew was going to be good. Yeah. And then the Shield came in, and I I was aware of Dean Ambrose whenever he was John Moxley on in the Independence. Mm-hmm. And and I was so excited because I'm like I really like this guy. He's finally gonna get a shot. So I kind of stayed invested after Punk left because we still had Brian and we still had Ambrose. Um. And so now Ambrose is gonna leave, which is a it's a real shame, I think, because I really like him. I think he's a very very talented worker. Um. But at the same time, I don't, I don't blame him because it does seem like the company definitely, you know, out of the out of the three members of the Shield, it seems pretty clear that he's the third member of the Shield. Oh, totally, yeah. And I would say he's probably known this for a while, and even when he's been able to carry the company. Um, you know, if Rollins is injured or if Reigns was injured or I remember he was out for like that uh, suspension. Yeah, that's right. And I think Ambrose was a champion at the time, wasn't he? Uh, I believe so, yeah. yeah. You know, like the guy, the guy can make stuff look good. Um, But it's, it's clear that they... You know the WWE have have also made it clear that they would rather go with Reigns and with with Rollins as their top guys. So you know he's he's pretty much by this point he's done a lot of he's done a lot in the company. You know former tag team U.S. Intercontinental Heavyweight Champion. The guys had a good run. Mm-hmm. So. Um, I'm a little bummed because he's so young. Like he 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 had a job for life. Yeah, he's so over. He could go on for another five years with no problems. Um, but you know, it's his choice. He can do what he wants. Um, and like I said, he's probably done like so much in the company anyway. The taking a little break is no big issue. Like he could still come back. Yeah, and I think in WWE's statement, which is kind of a rare thing for them to put out anyway when someone's contract is about to expire, but in their statement, they, they kind of said, uh, you know, we hope to work with him again in the future, um, which, you know, I, uh, I wouldn't be so sure that Ambrose will go back to WWE down the line. I think he might be... Uh, in the the CM Punk sort of category, where he's he's kind of had his fill of working on the the big stage and is eager to try something different. So, yeah. uh, and he, I kind of respect the fact that he's walking away from the job as well. Like he's probably you know making really good money, and the big rumors at the moment are that anyone who does have like a contract that's about to expire. Um, you know, WWE are going to try and offer them even more money to get them to stay. Um, but to Ambrose, the money doesn't really matter. It's all about the kind of creative side of it and being part of stories that he believes in and, uh, you know, being able to showcase his ability as a wrestler and all that kind of stuff. So that being more important than the money and him going elsewhere to seek that is, you know, commendable. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's not just him as well. You get like, uh, we've had, 
Hideo Itami hand in his walking papers this week as well, so he's going back to Japan by all accounts. Uh, and as we were talking about, like right at the very start of the podcast, like you got the revival who are also looking for their kind of way out of WWE as well. And these are all like people who are leaving because they don't care about the money. They just want, you know, a different environment to work in. Yes. Um, and, you know, it makes sense for Hideo Tommy to want to leave because they have done next to nothing with him since he arrived. When did he come in? 2015? Uh, I think it was 2014. 2014. But he had like a whole year off because he had those really bad like uh, shoulder injuries, I think it was. Yes. That is true. But even then, you're talking four years. Yeah. That they did very, very little with. Um, so I, I don't blame that guy because he, you know, he's, he's, he was a big name in Japan before he came here. He was arguably one of the best wrestlers in the world as well. Yeah, so you know that just by going back to Japan, that guy's going to be set up for life. Yeah. The guy doesn't have to go anywhere else. If he just goes back to Japan, he's going to be a big, big draw. Um, so, you know, he, he, he got some good, you know, uh, WWE money out of it. Now he can go back um, with his stock a lot higher. I think that's a good idea. Mm. The revival, I heard that their contracts don't end. It's either next year or the year after that. I think it's next year. Yeah. Um, and that the WWE aren't going to just give them their notice. They're not going to release them. So that means that they would be stuck not doing anything for a year. If that rumor is true, because mm-hmm. I don't know how true that rumor is. Um, again, like the revival aren't being used that well on the main roster. They do seem to be getting a very strange push, if you can call it that. But at the same time, they are still being used on television very regularly. Well, they are now. They, I'd say in the last maybe two or three months is really kind of uh they become almost like a focal point of the tag team division but before that jesus they barely even get on raw it seemed well here's the thing you like you said the last two or three months right Mm. um but the rumors that they wanted to leave sprung up just before the royal rumble yeah so I'm like, why would why would they be unhappy with their position in the company now that they're on TV? Because I guess uh, it's still you know wrestling four minute matches and losing more often than not, and you know when they were in NXT and they were stealing the show every night and getting to wrestle you know quality matches that went a decent amount of time, and you compare that to what they get to do on Raw, it's hard not to see why they'd be disheartened. Yeah, but at least they're getting used now and they're being on TV. And like we said, being on TV is the first step to like getting any further. That's the the most important bit. It Mm. it seems strange that they would start complaining now, now that they're on TV. That bit seems very strange to me. Like if they complained that they weren't being used and they wanted to release whenever they weren't on TV, that makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't don't know if I buy that rumor. Um but yeah, it's a very interesting time right now. Uh, mm. coming into WrestleMania, but not necessarily for WrestleMania related reasons, you know? Yeah, there's like lots of stuff going on in the in the business at the moment. So it's it's opening new doors for wrestlers and giving them different opportunities and uh, at the same time you've got like WWE trying to almost hoard wrestlers as well like signing people up and whatnot. So yeah, it's pretty weird at the moment. That I think is 
a bad idea because um, they have too many people in the show to begin with. Yeah, totally. I understand why they want to lock up a couple of specific people. But if you're going to do that, like, when was, remember it used to be that um, after, rest, I think it was after WrestleMania or after, at some point during the year, they would always end up, um, like, cutting a few people? Yeah, yeah. So, like, the, if it was, let's say it was after WrestleMania, like, you, you'd suddenly get, like, you'd see nine or ten new releases, you know, mm-hmm. I mean? people have been released. But the last couple of years, it haven't, that hasn't happened. No. People aren't being dropped. And this, like, I think that's the last couple of years. It's not, like, the last couple of months or whatever. It's been a while since they've actively been releasing people, which is very interesting. Nobody has seemingly been asking for the release before this, and, and they're not letting people go, and they've been doing this for a couple of months, um, which I assume is... Because now that they've got more money from like television deals and illegal Saudi Arabian deals or whatever, <laughs> that they have more money and now they don't have to cut as many costs and they can afford to keep some people at home. Which yeah. I, which I think is a good thing because at least you're being able to pay these people. But because um, then it you know if if you want to use them in the future you can. And they, obviously, in return, nobody is unhappy with their spot in the company because they hadn't been asking for releases either. You know what I mean? It, it mm. only feels really, really recently that we've been hearing a lot of people um, request a release. Well, I mean, it could have been a case of people asking for a release but uh, not being granted one and the news just not coming out. But who knows? Like, I wouldn't be surprised if people have been unhappy in WWE for a long time and you get guys like you know Zack Ryder who's been there god knows how many years and will happily take a paycheck while sitting on the sideline but there's other guys who I don't know I guess they want to go out and be able to do the thing that they're actually good at doing Um, and if that means you know walking away from WWE and finding somewhere else to do it, they sure do that because, you know, WWE might be the, the biggest game in town, but it's not the be or end or anymore. Oh, yeah. I totally think that there are some people who should kind of, who definitely could benefit while walking away. Um, but I just thought it was interesting how recently, like I said, the last couple of years, you haven't really heard about that too much. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, but I don't know. That's whatever. <laughs> uh, you want to wrap this up? Yeah, we'll wrap it up. Um, do you have anything else you want to say about the Royal Rumble or the state of wrestling at the moment? Um, not especially. I mean, uh, if we could see less of Baron Corbin, that would be nice. But <laughs> yeah. I just yeah. really, I really wanted to talk about the tag team thing because the, that was the one vibe I got after coming off watching Royal Rumble was that I didn't think either tag division looked good after that show. Mm. And I just wanted to kind of vent about that. But uh, otherwise, it's business as usual, basically. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I guess it's been another fantastic episode of wrestling doesn't make sense and we'll see you guys in the next one